Both uh, saying that you didn't vote in the Tibetan elections. Mm -hmm. Why not? <laughs> and that that was old story. Not much important. As a citizen of Tibet, I have a a responsibility to take part in the election of the leadership and uh, therefore I carry my voluntary test book also and I prepared. But during the course of campaign it was entirely different what we thought in the beginning, particularly what His Holiness has a vision of Tibetan democracy, which is uh, not only a Western concept of democracy. His Holiness usually used to say the genuine democracy. Genuine democracy means uh, the people must have the last word and people should have uh, the free will to choose their leadership, to elect their leadership. And uh, the system of campaign is not a Tibetan culture. It is entirely Western and modern culture, saying that I am the best and I must be elected. So <laughs> this is uh, something very funny. The Tibetan culture is, uh, uh, I cannot do, I am not very um, capable and uh, the other is better, something like that. Actually, this is uh, a different between cooperation and competition. The Tibet culture is based on the cooperation, not only Tibet culture, the ancient culture are based on cooperation and the modern culture is based on competition. Competition means one win and the other is lose and uh, therefore, so in a short, there are three things the first thing, as I mentioned, the uh, Western style throat cutting competition and uh, convincing using the demerits of the other candidate. Of course, they can uh, differ on the policy matters, but they cannot uh, uh, disrespect the person. They can uh, oppose the policy, but uh, individual person is uh, uh, equal, everybody is equal. And that's one thing. And uh, then the most I was hurt was uh, His Holiness, the knee had been repeatedly used for the campaign. And that is uh, uh, unthinkable for me. So then I thought it's better not to take part. Um, <coughs> so there is a way of not taking part. Mm -hmm. One is going to the uh, voting booth and uh, completing the process, which means bringing your green, green book mm -hmm. and then uh, getting a the voting mm, yes, voting and then like then like maybe not uh put not voting yeah that's right mm. uh, what how did you do did you like not not go no, at no, all? no i have not went there i thought uh, i do it very quietly and i have never intention to uh, publicize it so that morning the people asked are you going so i says no i'm not so feeling well, so I had not go. 
So that was all. Unfortunately, some of my friends from Amar Ujjala in Dharamsala, he thought I am here. And he telephoned me, uh, where you are watching, I wanted to take a photo. <laughs> so I said, I am not in Dharamsala, I am in the south. And then he says, are you taking part in the uh, voting? So I said, no, I have choose to not to. But so that small conversation he has brought up with and shared with many other uh, journalists and then they used to come out. Otherwise I was thought I just quite keep, keep myself away, you know, not, not to publicize it. <laughs> so what changes considering all these uh, um, the demerits in the election process? What changes do you suggest in the Tibetan election process? Actually, the first rules of the election was uh, very good. It is according to um, Tibetan culture and also it was according to the genuine democracy way for the people, by the people, of the people, as some of the Western people says. The two-layer system, first choosing the candidate by the people, with their free will, without any indoctrination or brainwashing through campaign, and let them think freely, let them, let them propose the candidate. And uh, this, that is only in our system. There is no any other system like that, twice. Then first, they choose the candidate. And then you will know most of the people wants what kind of candidate. Uh, so therefore, from the um, uh, first choosing of candidate, will know the people's basic tendency. Then among them, the most voted, the most pulled people, um, three, four, two, can be put for the final. And then and this can be used by the people. Then it is uh, not a, a competition, but it is a choice, free choice. The people are not being uh, indoctrinated and more, not being pressurized or not using their emotion about their uh, lineages or our their uh, uh, relation, such as uh, region, chulka, or religious tradition, without thinking any of this thing, just uh, so even like a candidate, they can choose for that. And then the final vote also, let the people choose, not people be not taught, oh, you, you must choose this, you must not choose this. That is, uh, uh, that is actually indoctrination, brainwashing, mm -hmm. then that, that, they deprive of the people's free will, free thinking. And apart from that, to exploit the emotion of people is very easy. You can say anything, and by that way, people can be carried away. So thereby, then it becomes ungenuine relation system. So our wish is I shouldn't say our wish. My wish is uh, just have a two-tier election, first candidate election as we do in the past time. Thereafter, the election commission choose two, three, four, whatever they wish. And then let the people vote. The candidates, if they withdraw, it is okay. If they do not withdraw, 
then they can ask by the election commission if you are choosing what will be your major policies they should be asked by the election commission in the past they do it then the election commission can tell people this candidate has this kind of idea of policy and this candidate has this kind of idea in the policy so therefore people should know if i choose mr a uh, his foreign policy economic policy or uh, education policy would be like this and uh, the mr b would be something different so this much knowledge people should have otherwise people should not be um, imposed many idea good and bad sort of it may be so by this way then uh, whatever is choosing is a, a genuine people's will not imposed people's will so this is my idea so basically uh, you are suggesting uh, the election commission to make clear the candidates policies so the people so to the people choose. yes and the candidate must not contact the people no people should have a, a support or oppose before the election they can support they can oppose when they put the vote and otherwise uh, the um, campaign system uh, has arose in lot of um, negative emotions in the mind of people and uh, that is the cause of division of the our unity and that is most important particularly uh, for a uh, nation like us in the in the crisis like india or like america they can do and they can compete or they can um, accuse each other but after the election they forgot and their unity is always there but we are a small community and we are in excel and therefore if our mind is divided and we have some kind of uh, um, unpleasant feeling with each other that is uh, very dangerous and very uh, damaging to the uh, cause of the tibet issue um, after the uh, the last session of the last uh, parliament Sitong and uh, speaker and other Tibetan leaders, leaders they had a had a what do you say audience should I say audience with Nechun and uh, Hong Sengchang. Mm -hmm. How do you read uh, Nechun and Sengchang's pronouncements mm -hmm. and their behaviors towards Sitong and speaker? Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I was not there. I only read the. Um, the prediction given by them tema and nejung is right from the uh, java gindun to the first dalai lama till the fourth and the dalai lama all the successive dalai lamas these two deities are the basic protector and uh, also to uh, to serve to help this holiness uh, uh, work and that they are very much connected with this holiness therefore from the fifth dalai lama both of these have become also put at rod the tibet government since the dalai lama is the head of government and then they also automatically become the government then during the election the campaign forces his holiness felt quite sad and uh, uh, he was not happy the way it was going on and uh, this unhappiness and due to that unhappiness his holiness uh, um, what did you say determination to uh, uh, live long life also sometimes shattered and that, that was noticed by these two uh, 
duties to oracles and i think it is their duty to to tell the people what is having because people could not infer or could not know what his holiness is thinking and they are able to know so therefore they have told it's clear to the people and then thereafter they realize there's something wrong and then the process of uh, apologizing and uh, <coughs> doing things better so i think the two um, oracle says have done their inevitable responsibility what they should do they have done how relevant is it to concept oracles considering that the leaders have been elected by the people there is no connection between these two to consult oratory oracles is when you are not able to decide something choose some decision by your own rational mind or by your own reason because there are many things in future are unknown and that the oracles are considered to be know all the three times the past the present the future and therefore we uh, consult them and uh, in the consultation it is also our limitation that sometimes we understood what they have saying and sometimes we do not understood and uh, in my life experience by consulting the oracles has never been uh, uh, went wrong what whatever they have told uh, and we are able to do according to that um, uh, it was uh, it was a good for example his holiness escaped from uh, from from novelenka in 1959 it was funny the oracles always saying that his holiness should not go anywhere he must be stay in novelenka novelenka is safe in all this only the morning of the 17th then they completely changed he must go out and go out this night and not a minute late so that was a chance and, and it was given by if they if they if they say he soon is go out it might be a leak out and but by this way at many times this is only one example there are many times this kind of uh, contradictory uh, sometimes uh, um, telling are later on realized that even um, 1950 Seven and fifty-eight in the beginning of fifty-eight, the Nature Oracle has uh, almost told clear that now there is no much hope. But you do this and you do that and you do you do whatever he wants to say, and I will able to make a bridge to cross the uncrossable river. So this kind of thing, um, even. elected people to consult oracle is uh, who should be the leader who should be the leader that will be choose by but the leader when he or she is in doubt they can consult the oracles uh, it is said that some former colonists uh, including yourself had a meeting with the uh, Swami Sri Dalai Lama after the elections. Can you tell us a bit about the meeting and what the, what the Swami Sri Dalai Lama said? We were quite in uh, 
worried and uh, we feel uh, a sense of urgency. The oracles has uh, given very drastic, even his holiness life is uh, um, uncertain. This kind of oracle uh, prediction was there. And uh, his holiness is keeping distance from the Kashak and uh, other functionaries and uh, we can see the unhappiness of his holiness in deep although he did not tell but we can see and uh, at such moment we thought his holiness must be approached to request not to be um, annoyed with the people and whatever they, have, whatever they have done wrong, they should be told and, um, and they will, uh, they will uh, correct their mistakes and uh, mm. therefore we have an audience His Holiness and uh, if he is uh, not happy, he must be given pardon for whose he will have uh, done the wrong and we also approach the Chitu and Kasha together you must approach his holiness and say sorry and you must try to uh, uh, clarify whatever misunderstanding or whatever his holiness unhappiness that they should be removed to remain like this in a distance, it is uh, not good for the uh, cause of the Tibet people. So that was uh, our mission. And we uh, asked His Holiness forgiveness, and uh, <coughs> His Holiness told us what what was reasons uh, of his unhappiness. And then we went to the Kashak and Chitu. They must see His Holiness, and. Uh, make things clarified, they must be apologized. So this was our, uh, a kind of liaison between His Holiness and the, the people in the administration. And what? I think uh, that helped a little bit to bring closer. Then of course we are not alone. There were the Rinpoche and all the abbots of the Monasteries has also come. Apart from that, many former um, government officials has also written something like that. So many people has uh, uh, tried to uh, make the gap to narrow, and uh, finally, it had happened. Can you specify, uh, specific detail, what exactly this one is? I do not remember. I think that is now in the public. I was told among the um, Kazurs and uh, Sotu Surva. In the beginning, we thought whatever His Holiness has told us should be kept uh, secret. It should not be in the public. And some people says no, public should know. But anyhow, later on. The Kazurs who are not in Dharamshala, who are living outside, have been informed through uh, through email, and that has been leaked. Now everybody knows what His Holiness told. The basic thing is His Holiness uh, has uh, this kind of throat cutting competition, and um, uh, accusing each other is uh, not good. Number one. And then number two is uh, many statements are not based on truth, reality. There are a lot of uh, untruth things are being told. I think this is the two basic things. Tibetan religious 
sects are represented in the parliament. How relevant do you uh, see with this? And what purpose, what purpose do they serve, the religious entrance? <laughs> that is the... That is the Tibetan political question. I'm not very willing to answer to this, but uh, since you have asked, nineteen fifty nine, um, the Tibetan government in Lhasa was so called dissolved by the Chinese authorities and uh, then we refugees gathered together in the December 1959, January 1960, about 6,000, 7,000 Tibetan refugees. Most of them are leadership of their respective groups are gathered in Bodh Gaya and at that time one thing very positive and unique thing had happened which was started in 1958 when uh, the uh, people of Chushgandu and Ando uh, offered His Holiness uh, uh, non-life prayer and the Tukho Wanchin. And at that time, there are talk of the unit of all Tibetan nation, because Tibetan nation was divided into many segments, and only the Nrichu is considered to be border between China and Tibet. More than 55% of Tibets are outside of the Gadam Podang's rule. And they are for a long time uh, as, a, as a subject of China. And, but they are by race, by nation, by language, by Dharma, they are all Tibetans. And the unity uh, coming together, all the Tibetans were felt necessary since 1958 and 1959. In 1959 December and 1960 January in Gaya, the uh, Congregation of people have genuinely agreed that henceforth all the three Chukas will remain uh, united like a, like a goal of Aaron. Nobody can destroy it. So they have written it in His Holiness, giving this pledge to His Holiness. And since then, a unity of three Chulka was uh, explicitly asserted by the people. And not only Chulka, we also need the unity of the religious traditions. Although the four traditions are belonging to Buddhism, and the pre-Buddhist tradition is also not much different from Buddhism. They are quite similar. And the five religious traditions should also um, should also unite it as one, not only in the religious affairs, but also in the social political affairs. Our unity must be expressed 
through the unity of the old religious traditions and through the unity of the old shukas. So that was the basic idea. And at that time, the uh, Assembly of Tibet People's Deputies, now we call Tibet Parliament in Excel, was started. And at that time, in order to the unity, we have given representation equal to everyone. Otherwise, inside Tibet and also in Excel, the Chulkasum, from population viewpoint, they are not equal. Some of them, large population, some of them less population, some of them majority. Some similarly, the uh, Chulus are also the population very very, and uh, not considering the population. Only the Chulka and Chulu was given the most importance and in order to exhibit they are all equal, so equal representation was given in the assembly. And apart from that, how to represent people into a kind of parliament we call in the English uh, all segments of the people, uh, all work of life. The work of life are divided either by um, region, geographical region, or cultural language, or religious uh, affiliation, religious tradition. So in order to make a unity of all religious traditions and all culture and all religion, so for this purpose we have the assembly, assembly of people's deputy elected by the people are giving equal representation so that to understand by ourselves and to also show to the others that we are all equal. The minorities or the majorities or the larger area or the smaller area, there is no difference. We are all equal and we are all working together. So this was the beginning of the assembly. And apart from that, since to represent all of life in the parliament, the religious traditions should also be there because uh, even today the secularism is uh, very popular uh, all over the world and particularly in the western world. But you will find in the western there are three, four countries they have in the parliament representation of the Catholic Protestant and other religious minorities they do have. They also argue that it is also a segment of society, segment of life. They have their own unique, uh, um, uniqueness and that should be representing the parliament. So therefore to make the religious traditions uh, integrated and to make the chulkas integrated, the parliament has been making like that. And now you can debate whether it is necessary or the representation of chulkasum can uh, sufficient to show the unity of the Tibetan people. It can be debatable and the future people will debate and can, can be decided. But it is not against a democratic principle or it is not against uh, practicing way of the many democratic countries and I do not see um, anything um, wrong for having 
religious traditions representation in the parliament now the your second part of question do this benefit to the religious traditions then uh, i should say uh, very much doubt either it is benefit or it is harm for the real religious practice and that is very much debatable and otherwise as a showing the people's unity it is okay and um, the religious people there are many different ways particularly the buddhist countries if you if you look at the buddhist countries today the country who are claiming as buddhist countries are only three Myanmar Shyam Shyam is uh, Thailand and Sri Lanka and uh, Sri Lanka do not say they are Buddhist country they says Buddhism is the officially recognized religion and uh, Thailand says they are Buddhist country Burma says they are Buddhist country constitutionally and uh, Burma and Thailand the monks do not take any part in the political process neither the vote that neither they can stand for uh, any post so they are out of politics and uh, thailand is also same sri lanka is like us sri lanka monks can vote sri lanka monks monks can stand for uh, political posts and even they are a monk so this is difference and in the recent time the, the, the bhutan is also a buddhist country and uh, in the bhutan's all bhutan's constitution also says the monks cannot participate monks and nuns are not participating in the voting system and the mongolia is also this country they are now debating at this moment is mongolian monks and can become parliament members and they can vote so among the buddhist countries are there are different ways of approaching it so in the future when tibet become more autonomy or we have our own um, kind of parliament then uh, whether religious traditions should represent or should not represent that can be Uh, re-examined but at this moment I don't see there's any demerit in it so um, <clears throat> talking about transparency, transparency unity and equality mm. in, the, in, the, in the good democratic process the sectarian representatives have two votes for their uh, as they can uh, vote in the Cholka as well as to elect uh, a religious set. Don't you think this is undemocratic? This is a debatable. One man, one vote is a, a general principle. But um, if you look at uh, many democratic countries, they do have this kind of thing. I can give an example. Uh, Punjab Assembly and uh, similarly some other states of Assembly, they have uh, uh, MLAs elected by the graduates and graduates have an um, electoral college and whosoever is graduated from the university they registered their names into the uh, graduate in college and they do what for the MLA coming from the graduate college and they also vote for their own constituency and they also one man can vote uh, to different people and then here also one man one vote is that one man can choose 
in the constituency one representative can be choosing. My constituency one is Nima tradition, my other constituency is Dottu, then I cannot put two votes for the two representation. I can put one vote for the two representation. And the other is a different constituency, that's a new tradition constituency. I can vote one there. So if you vote one to one constituency, that is interpreted as one and one vote. And this kind of um, um, now I don't know it is it is there. Otherwise, after independence, there are Angol uh, Indian membership in the parliament. They are small society Angol Indian. They also do like this, vote to twice for different constituencies, and for different constituency, the two word does not. Uh, Valid the principle of one and one word. Now, because of this uh, one and one word uh, concept, there are more and more younger generation Tibetans calling for I don't scrap totally the the religious sects representatives, or uh, everybody should be given the same opportunity because we all pay the same amount of tax to the, the CTA. What do you have to say about that? This debate has uh, um, logic. I don't say this debate is illogic, but it is for the people to decide. I have no considered opinion about this. There are two different ways. From one way, at this moment, uh, among the Tibetan voters, I don't think uh, there's anyone who declare as no believer or belonging to any of the religious traditions. S then one way is uh, the religious traditions representative also can be voted by everyone not only the monks and nuns. Every people who are belonging to any religious tradition can vote for that. This is one way. Or the other way is uh, the monks and nuns choose only their own religious traditions uh, representative and they are not voting for the Shulkas representation. This is a different option. Or the third option is to remain status quo. That also not much. Uh, or so the religious sect if all the field another option. Religion. Yes, that is also. Yeah. That is also, but uh, actually in the beginning when we uh, adopted the charter, the Chulu Rime, the word of Chulu Rime was not there, and it was. Uh, substituted by Shusi Sundil. And since Charter has the preamble as a Shusi Sundil, then a religious representation is also, if somebody argues in the court, may say, unless you change this, there should be religious representation. That can also be argued. So in the legal way, there are so many different kind of arguments mm -hmm. can be put forward. <coughs> now this is on to another topic. <coughs> what do you think about Tibetans getting Indian citizenship? According to Indian law, many Tibetans, in, in, in many Tibetans are Indian citizens by virtue of being born in India. And because of that, some Tibetans have filed cases in court to exercise their right. So what do you think about that? 
to become any country citizen is individual's right and uh, nobody can stop that and it is for the individual whether he or she should retain the tibetan citizenship or should give up and uh, adopt the other country citizen that is all individual's right nobody can encroach it nobody can say you must become indian citizen that is also uh, against democracy or should not whatever it is individual choice but indian citizenship the people do not understand fully when we are arriving in india as refugee that was 1959 1959 the indian citizen law was the old one from 1959 to 1987 or 77 i do not remember correctly one of them maybe 87 yeah the old law was remained and according to that old law also even is born in indian soul automatically he or she becomes indian citizen that is the lawful but that boy or girl when reaches the age of 16 obtains an uh, rc residential certificate then at that moment that boy or girl become refugee not an indian citizen because by his or her own choice obtained the rc that means i am a foreigner i am a refugee living here so who have obtained rc then he or she cannot say i am indian citizen because of i born here till he was 16 years of age he was indian citizen he or she was indian citizen but when he takes the rc then he or she become the tibetan refugee that is the way of course he or she can return the rc and i will not remain uh, tibetan refugee since i born here i must get back my indian citizenship that can be claimed and the court or the administration shall have to give that and uh, after 87 the law was changed then even you are born in india you do not become automatically indian citizen then you shall have to apply for indian citizenship applying indian citizenship is a, a process if any independent country then their embassy shall have to recommend and for us the bureau of historian the dalai lama daily or the kashak is authorized to recommend that so not a recommendation no objection we say no objection we have no objection to this person become indian citizen so then he or she can obtain indian citizenship that is for everybody whether born in india or not born in india who live for long time and there are few um, uh, conditions i do not remember exactly knowing some indian language or uh, intend to live in india and um, uh, ready to uh, uh, obey or the indian law something like that in this conditions are people 12 years huh? 12 years of or something yeah 12 years mm-hmm. so these conditions then he or she can take a indian citizenship but in the other countries without taking citizenship there are many limitations and uh, difficulties 
in India remain no Indian citizen have not much problem. All the rights are almost equal. Even the Tibetan refugee or Tibetan refugee's uh, descendants uh, can compete for uh, Indian administrative service, Indian foreign service or Indian defense service and they can do business, they can purchase landed property. It differs from state to state but even you can have a permission from the reserve bank and from the state you can owe lands and all this. So therefore the need for become citizen is uh, very limited. A citizen or a non-citizen there's not much difference as far as the uh, freedom and uh, rights are concerned. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is very clearly mentioned in our charter according to Article 8 to mm -hmm. that any exiled Tibetan can take citizenship of another country mm -hmm. if in case it becomes unnecessary, mm -hmm. provided he or she uh, obeys the uh, Article 13, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. So taking Indian citizen uh, any other country mm. doesn't mean he or she is uh, uh, giving up the exalted Tibetan. Uh, That's very true. I very much remember that article was debated in the parliament very l long time and finally uh, he fulfills the responsibilities of the Article 13, and he or she cannot consider to be given up the Tibetan citizenship. He can remain Tibetan citizenship. But that is 100% legal if you go to nation by nation. There are many nations, they allow dual citizenship. And in that case, our charter is okay. There are many nations who do not allow dual citizenship. In India also there is no provision for dual citizenship. Only non-resident Indians there is some provision. Otherwise, uh, one person cannot hold two different citizenships. So it is uh, our internal matter that we can take Voluntary test from them, and we can give some benefits. Otherwise, uh, uh, according to Indian law, or it is dis disputed some in the court of law, then uh, our charter cannot stand. And uh, to clarify uh, about your statement about Tibetans when they reach 16 years of age. Mm -hmm. It is like kind of automatic rather than a choice. When I was 16, I was like, do you want to become Indian? Uh, do you want to take RC? I was never told this. It was automatic, you have to make RC. What do you think about that? The, that, that was a negligence of our own and the negligence of the politi uh, uh, policy departments. Otherwise, at that time, before the law was changed, you can very well, you can say, I will not take it. But at that time, one thing we must remember is then the refugee benefits will not be applicable. If you are need to apply for house or land, house or land, or any other thing which is uh, given for the Tibetan refugees, then you are not entitled to that. You become an Indian citizen and you will not get a piece of land or piece uh, house or free education in the schools. All this which are given to the Tibetan refugees shall have to be seized, mm -hmm. shall have to be stopped. So therefore, the parents and the children and the uh, Indian department, nobody has bothered it. So as soon as you see, of course they are all in the schools, 
three schools and uh, if he said no uh, I'm not taking uh, RC then at that time uh, that boy may be about class 8th or 9th they would say okay now you have to pay fees something like that this is the technical <laughs> problem one last question many Tibetan younger generation Tibetans including myself we are looking forward to uh, getting Indian citizenship and why we do this we are particularly aiming to get a passport uh, so that means we will become like we will become Tibetan Indians so do you think this will have uh, ramifications as a Tibetan may not be very, very huge or very um, immense impact to the Tibetan movement whosoever taking other citizenship even there's no provision for dual citizenship they remain in their mind as Tibetans in America or in other European countries, they would, they would say uh, Tibetan Americans or Chinese Americans, something like that. Uh, one's own race or nation is always uh, combined with that. Then what basic difference would be then the person can work as Tibetan support group, not as the Tibetan. As a Tibetan, I fight for my own rights. And Tibetan support groups, I support the Tibetan people for fighting their rights. So this will be difference. And psychologically, and uh, it has some ramification, some effect to work as a Tibetan for fighting one's, one's own cause or fighting as a Tibetan support group to support people there is some difference no, again, My point is because our charter says we can be Tibetan at the same time because I have not given up allegiance to the CTA I pay tax to the CTA That's true There is only in those countries which dual citizenship is legal and uh, wherever the dual citizenship is illegal then our charter cannot overrule their constitution so in that case legally morally you may say i am a tibetan but legally you are not a tibetan if you are uh, go to the Chinese embassy to protest and you are arrested and jailed at that time you will not treat it as Tibet, Tibetan you will treat it as American or Indian or something like that so this is the difference